Greetings, and welcome to the Cell Portrait Gospel Podcast. I'm your host, Dakota Brown. Let's take a trip into a sonic voyage of music, culture, human expression, and above all, the minds of our very unique guests that we share a space with. If you like what we do on this independently owned podcast, you can always show some love by supporting our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash self-portrait gospel podcast. Thanks to all of our listeners and enjoy the show. I mean, my experience of it was more like, I mean, for me, it, it was not like the most, it, um, I was very, very lucky to be like, I had just finished a bunch of touring, uh, like literally like March of 2020, Wow, I think, or the very end of February, I had like played my last, sh- what was going to be my last show for quite a while. Um, so I was really lucky um, that I didn't have anything on the horizon there. So, you know, like for me, it was kind of, um, you know, it wasn't like catastrophic, um, in that way. Um, but I, but my experience of it is that like every, every, uh, in terms of like the power structure in music, it's sort of like, I feel like, uh, or I don't feel like I know that from the top down, um a lot of people i think have used the pandemic as an opportunity to sort of seize seize uh control or get a better deal for themselves right. get more profit you know and i think and and part of it is like being conservative and sort of self um self preservation because i you know i know that there's a lot of risk involved putting on shows and things now and putting out records and all but but i also get the sense that it's like every and it's not just music it's like everything just feels like it's clamped down it just was like an opportunity for people to just grab, grab more, you know, grab more power or something. And just, I feel like everybody who couldn't do that at that time is now in a worse position somehow, even possibly than we were before. Yeah. Um, I, so. I can agree to that. Yeah. And that's what I see. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously there are, a ton of positive things that came out of that if some can even believe it and i feel like that's true yeah that's true too yeah i think a lot of people you know and obviously we can both agree for ourselves we're just kind of sitting around and just being like all right well let's start a brand or let's start a company or even a band and i think a lot of small businesses whether that's just kind of via so- social media and there's not so much as the the brick and mortar you know that kind of uh yeah. business but you know what i mean like so many people are like fuck it i'm gonna start a smoothie company like i didn't never had the time and it's it's been really interesting to see a lot of people starting starting things and just kind of putting a foot mm. forward i mean i did see yeah. that especially kind of moving back to my hometown this past year um it's like man there are so many more local businesses and i don't know if that's necessarily pandemic related but i'm i do know a couple people that have started businesses around here they're like yeah we were just kind of sitting on just like a, a little money to move across the monopoly board and we we're just like mm. let's just go let's just jump it can't get any worse like right <laughs> world is broken yeah. let's start our you know our local grocery like <laughs> right yeah it was it was an opening um like uh it just was such a disruption to our normal flow that yeah a lot of people had like new ideas which is that is great you know or or, or that could be great yeah in some cases it's great some cases it's yeah. bad yeah yeah and man is, is a person such as yourself that's you know you're an extremely seasoned musician you've been doing this for quite some time um before we get on a on a different note, um, mm. I'm super super curious to know, you know, your experience of like, outside of like, you know, touring and 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 the the financial aspect has 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 always been there, right? Like it's you know we all have that job and it's like all right, I'm gonna take off for three weeks. Like there there were always mm. those elements, but during the pandemic how much did that play a part in your life or influence you in the sense of 
kind of changing your perspective of what it means to travel and 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 play music just like this the 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 simple not simple but just like the the general task of i have music i'm going to this city i'm going to this state this country how much has has that changed your perspective now that we're almost you know we're this summer i mean it, it's been four years since that's happened roughly um Yeah. how much has that changed just kind of your process and approach of what being a musician is like now Well, um, I mean, as far as traveling and playing shows, um, it's just gotten harder and harder. Um, and it's hard to hard to explain why I've been kind of trying to put my finger on it for myself just to see like what exactly has changed. But um but I mean, um the pandemic I, for me, I was I was able to get on unemployment right away from the you know pretty soon after it. I don't know when that was like April or May. I was like already applying and got you know I got on the the um, once the pen once the uh, what was it called like the the um, the pandemic unemployment went through. Then it was like suddenly I got I was making during those months I was making twice as much as I would normally make, which is not very much. But <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm. I was suddenly like, you know, had money. Um, I put some money away for a second. It's all gone. It was all gone instantly. But, um, but for me, I was actually in a good position financially during the like during the height of lockdown, um, and I was really lucky because I was like, hey, I'm going to start writing some new songs, and I'm kind of used to um, these phases of. kind of hiding myself away and just kind of like, you know, ideally um, living really cheap or, or, you know, just sort of like removing myself from the, um, the hustle and bustle and just kind of, you know, having the luxury of like writing is something that I've like been able to do, you know, at certain key times. Um, so it's sort of a part, you know, every couple of years, um, if I'm lucky, I'm able to do that. And and um, so the pandemic kind of happened at a time when I was ready to do that. I was it was easy for me to jump on that kind of way of existing. Um, so it was, you know, it really was not so bad for me. And then um, as it ended, then trying to figure out how to play shows and get back into the normal swing of things, I'm still figuring it out. You know, it's it's a whole new world, and I feel like. Um, When I try to book shows and stuff, for example, I mean, Folk Yeah has been very kind and um, set me up with shows and stuff. But a lot of people, a lot of places that I've gone to before, it's like, they're like, well, you haven't toured in, in four or five years, you know, like, um, what are your stats? You know, let's see, let's see how much, you know, like, we're not too sure about you uh, drawing here. So it's like places that I played before, I'm like, they don't even want to give me a guarantee. And it's all, it's all percentage. You know, it's all like a door deal. Uh, so that's something that's changed since the pandemic. Um, for me, it just sort of like the booking game has gotten a lot more ruthless. Um, but, you know, I'm not like, I'm, I'm in a good position to to, to navigate that um, at the moment. I'm glad I have a new record out. And, uh, you know, I've been through so many different phases of this over the years. It's not, I know things you know, things go up and down. So Yeah, it's not that's like, where, that's where I'm at. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like you're just now starting a band and kind of, but I guess at the same time, kind of have to stop myself there. You would just set that as a standard, you know, you'd be like, oh, well, I guess it's kind of always been this way. And you just kind of, that's the new standard. Like people don't, they don't know Mm. Mm. reference of what it was like before. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting, like historically and just in general on a like a generational kind of perspective of yeah they they let us play here because we have you know two hundred thousand followers on instagram or you know or whatever it may be based off of these these stats or these you know being able to forecast immediately like oh yeah th this band's gonna bring in you know right it's and i mean yeah it, it's like the wild west i mean it really is <laughs> it, it's just it's kind of every you know anything goes at any time i mean like um 
I don't know. I mean, for years, you know, like I, I booked shows myself and I remember, you know, the first time starting to work with a booking agent and being like, well, this is so weird. And um, the paradigm has just changed so many times. And like back then, you know, we were still selling CDs. So making money off of, you know, this is, I'm talking about pre-streaming days. Um, you know, like that was a big change to weather and, you know, that's just, just another change. And it's just music um, in capitalism. It's, it's just always going to be seeing what everybody just seeing what they can get away with. And, you know, we're just, I guess we're sort of used to living this way. I want to, yeah. I, I want to add yeah. on to that really quickly. Um, sure. Me and my fiance watched this um, series last night it's called the, like the two thousands. Um, and I, I was born in 94. So of course it's like, okay you know, anything before that, of course, my, my decade that I, you know, everybody has that time where like, I wish I can go back. And I wish I was this age mm. this time. Mm. I would have definitely wanted to be around for the, the eighties, like the, the new wave, the no wave, like all that stuff. But mm. we watched, <laughs> we watched an episode last night on specifically with, you know, Napster and the mm. doctrine of pirating music. And I, you know, being mm. in, second and third grade when this was kind of happening i do remember you know the older kids on the back of the bus and kind of you know chumming up to them and they're like all right fine i'll i'll burn you a a, a green day cd or i'll burn you a three six mafia CD, <laughs> whatever yeah. It was. um yeah you know being around during this time as a young musician such as yourself um did you have any perspective or any kind of um, individual kind of opinions on this during that time of like, man, you need to be buying the. Oh God, no, you're talking about five. No, 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 no. Right. I mean, um, when I, I, I think the time I'm trying to picture what time that was like, you're maybe like late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, well, yeah, I guess. That, or when was, when was that? When was Napster? Like the Napster and like the pirate, pirate bay it was like i guess like maybe oh, pirate, yeah. oh three oh four around that time just kind of like okay. the, you know i don't know if if you had just started playing music around that time or was even oh, like, oh yeah no no guys if not <laughs> oh no no that's okay i'm old i'm uh so uh in the mid 90s uh well 97 i started with my first record store job um i was 22 is that right? Yeah, I was 22. And um, I worked at this record store called Streetlight Records in Santa Cruz and still there. And um, we would, I mean, I, you know, you just work, the, you work there to get music, you know, or I, I, I worked there to not even to like collect records because I'm not even really like a collector, but it was like, I just wanted access to that, you know, this library of music right. that's out there, that stuff that you can't find, it's hard to find, and, you know getting into esoteric um, uh, musical interests and stuff. So um, I think the time that you're talking about early 2000s, I had already been, you know, like you're getting records, you're, you know, I mean, well, when I, even before that, when I was a teenager, you know, I was taping, you know, always taping records, you know, making tape, cassette tapes of records. I remember like in high school, you know, some older kid or your my, my guitar teacher, made me cassette tapes of like Eric Dolphy and Captain Beefheart and stuff. And it was like these records I could never have found on my own. Um, so from the get go, I mean, I've never had the idea of like, Oh, you have to buy something to, to get access to it. Like to me, I'm like, I'm a musician. This is my right. It's my right to right. have yeah. access to, to this stuff. It's my research material, you know? Um, and um, with Napster and all that stuff, I mean, I remember Metallica, Yep. <laughs> just you know it's just so embarrassing to just you guys look like idiots they look like the they look like such man. such tools yeah there's they're yeah. like the richest people in the world telling you you know telling you that you've got to pay for their their crappy music yeah. uh i mean i like old metallica but yeah, um the, but the, anyway the music during that time too was was not the metallica that we still you know <laughs> right right hold a light yes yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, these, obviously, you know, these guys just look like industry stooges, right? Like, like, um, I, I mean, um, I when I worked at Amoeba after Streetlight Records, that was ninety nine two thousand. 
I worked at the Amoeba in Berkeley. And um, at that point, then there was the um, the commercial CD recorders, the CDR machines. And I remember being so excited about getting one of those. And I'm like, finally, I can, you know, I can really make good copies of stuff. So I was, you know, I was checking out records from Amoeba. You could, rec- you could check out um, 15 records or 20 records or something at a time. They'd sign you out in this book. And um, so I would check out stuff. And it was too, if it was too expensive for me to buy or I didn't have, like, credit at the store to get it, I would just, you know, burn. So I had this large CDR library of music that I was ripping off of LPs and CDs. And I, it's, I mean, it's funny to think about now. It was so labor intensive. But um, by the time the file sharing came around, you know, like, I was just, you know, I've, I have no qualms about downloading that stuff. And... You know, like, I think, I think that, um, I do think that we have to support musicians financially to keep music going, but I don't think that that means everybody has to pay for everything. I think there's enough people that can pay for it that will. And, um, you know, I'm not, I don't think streaming music is terrible. It's, it's, I I feel like we went the wrong way a long time before that. And this is all just kind of like part of our bad bad um culture just kind of playing itself out it, it's fine i mean it's no worse than anything else we're doing streaming music but i do think um it changes everything it devalues a lot of things it makes some things more valuable it makes some things less valuable but I, i'm i mean i'll just say i'm in favor of you know of course i want to see higher streaming royalties i mean you know obviously like it's bad if nobody pays for anything. And right. I think the, and I, th- and, and also the problem isn't just that no one's paying for anything it, as I understand it. Um, and I'm not an expert on this, but I think the problem is that people that we pay these subscription fees, but then like, um, you know, Daniel Eck or whatever his name is, the spot or is that the spot of like, like the, you know, the rich guys that own these companies, they get, they get, you know, all of that money and then there's just a fraction that trickles down to artists and nothing trickles down to smaller artists and et cetera. So I just think it's the way it's broken down is really bad. And I don't know, I'm not opposed to it all, but it should, it's not done fairly, obviously. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a touchy subject, man, for sure. Because obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, from one music lover musician to a to another it's like you listen to music all day every day constantly searching for new bands or just listening to stuff that you've always listened to or maybe it's just Mm -hmm. like a live cure recording you've never heard of or whatever it may be yeah Mm -hmm. you're still gonna buy like when you're on the road touring it's like and you stop off you've got some time you got a day in between you know dates and you're you know, in a place you've never been, you go to a bookstore, a record store, you're probably going to buy that right. Eric Dolphy, you know, um, yeah. LP or what have you. It's, it's, it's always kind of there to have that physical, you know, your one book and your three LP purchase, you know, for that evening. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. And I, I don't have a problem with anybody who just even, you know, only listens to streaming music or doesn't pay for any of it. I don't think it comes down to it like on a person by person basis. It's the system itself yeah. that, that's fucked up. Yeah. And, um, you know, some people, especially musicians, I just feel like musicians shouldn't have to pay for music. Um, I don't know. There should be some kind of disc. I was kind of like surprised when I signed up for Spotify. I, I thought, Oh, surely, you know, a musician shouldn't have to pay. Like, like the fact that you have yeah. to pay for Spotify to, to have a Spotify artist account so you can like look at all their data, you know, now I realize how naive that was. But at first I was like, what, they're not going to just give me a free, you know, can I get like a discount account or something? I was like, so, so dumb, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah that man, that is the ultimate dead horse. I, yeah. and I'm, you know, even though I'm, you know, I, I'm, I've always been a YouTube person. I mean, mm-hmm. since like 2003, 2004, that's coming up on 20 years, being in middle school, you know, being out here in the sticks and watching, you know, skateboard videos and, and getting into music. Like I was very much like 
what was that weird band that person told me about? And you're like searching on YouTube with like maybe one word. And you're just trying to find it. Like I Yeah. still do that. You know what I mean? It's like, Mm -hmm. is that jazz who played whatever for Miles Davis? And he's got some weird solo record. Like it's, if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be on YouTube. And so there is always that, you know, listening to things via those elements. But I, I agree with you, man. I, I, I appreciate that. that perspective and of course coming from a musician such as yourself and the things that you know you've achieved over your career it's to, to be able to be like yeah as long as people are listening to the music and enjoying the music that's the most important part and everything else can kind of just fall into place or or not <laughs> i don't you know what i mean like it's it's this weird Yeah. machine of I don't know if it'd ever be right, but I, I wanted to jump back really quickly. Obviously, you know, growing up in in Los Angeles and, and working at the record stores that you that you have in the past, I imagine so many interesting characters. And I and I want to like kind of bottleneck that because it's people out of California, and of course, in the mid to late nineties when you know vinyl. Bands weren't putting things out so much on vinyl. I mean, maybe different, you know, certain genres, certain um, cultures, but you had this like crazy um, kind of renaissance for vinyl collecting, rare private press. Um, just before we kind of move forward, I just wanted to kind of go back to that really quickly. What was that culture like during that time? I mean, Obviously, this is right before what we just spoke about with the streaming and things just being very much available. What was it like to kind of still be in, not the end, but towards the end of that culture of people coming Mm. in and looking for, you know, weird private press recordings? Like, what was that atmosphere like being around those type of, like, serious heads during that time? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you what other people's experience was like, but, um, mine was, well, first of all, that, you know, when no one was like that, the term private press, I don't think I'd never heard that back then. I don't know if that existed. Um, but people were certainly, I mean, I just had my, things were just much smaller and more, my, my local sense of things was just from, you know, whatever my friends were, were hip to. And it was really just based on what was physically, geographically available to you. So, you know, in the late 90s, I was in Northern California. And in, in Santa Cruz, California, there was um, there was a lot of like weird stuff to, to find. Um, you know, being a college town, there was, um, you know, people people with real deep interests and, you know, kind of the, like as far as... Um, Like po like kind of counterculture and post hippie and punk and um you know that that was that was kind of a hot spot you know being close to San Francisco and also um, what was there I'm trying to remember like you know people were starting to collect like I had a couple of friends that were into this guy Bobby Brown I think that was his name who I think now I don't know if it's been reissued but it was like this guy that lived on a boat in Santa Cruz with his dog and he. made a bunch of homemade instruments and he recorded this album like on his boat and you know sometimes copies of this record like because i think this guy just you know probably pressed up a couple hundred and just gave them out to all his friends so you those were like not that hard to find like they might just be in the thrift store bin um so things like that were more like you know whereas now that would just be like what you know that'd be insane to find that and people still do but back then it was a little bit more like oh this guy's from he's from this town Yeah, that stuff is kind of still around there and it didn't seem quite so precious. But Right. people were definitely like excited about it. I mean, I remember a couple of friends had found those records and were like, just because they loved the music, the music was actually good. Um, and it wasn't like now where it's like, or at least, uh, I don't know, at least among my friend group, I would say it wasn't like now where people sort of were into things just for their scarcity in a way. I think Right. like back then it was like, well, I feel like mostly... people were like would get excited about things that they actually connected to musically 
or somehow culturally. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I see now that's sort of like, you know, being reiss reissued or so, a lot of it, and some of my friends who are in this world probably would be mad at me for saying this, but I feel like a lot of it doesn't really measure up to me musically, like um, mm -hmm. as being exceptional, but, but I do get just, you know, sometimes the really unexceptional things are interesting too. Um, just in terms of the, like, in sort of like, you know, I know people love like, for instance, with garage rock, it's like, you know, we love all the different bands that sound exactly like the stones because there are these minor differences, you know, regionally, or like, maybe there aren't even those minor differences. And we just love the proliferation of, of um, that style or something. I get that too. Right. But I just, yeah, my experience of it was more like, we're into things that are just really special music. And I remember a few things popping up like that. But um, I I'm trying to remember, I mean, it was just this was just the beginning of things kind of starting to get reissued right um like i remember I'm trying to remember what some of these cool reissues thing you know things back then were there was like like i remember drag city reissued the, the first four scott walker records oh, and it was like and it was like oh you know like what are i just didn't know what is this weird guy scott one and scott two and i remember the people in the record store being kind of like oh yeah you should check that out it's kind of weird you know and um yeah there was there was a lot of weird stuff to find but i just like you say with youtube i mean there's always going to be weird stuff to find it's a matter of your awareness shifting to like what's what's interesting and out there on the edge you know there's tons of there's tons of crazy internet art out there now that's on the edge of being lost um it's there for you to find i mean um th that never i don't think there's any finite point when when everything is known you know like it's there's always going to be that edge of things to get into so back then it was records i guess and tapes um but now it's something else probably yeah man first and foremost bobby brown is incredible <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's i haven't heard him in you know 30, 20 years or whatever but i remember and, liking that one. yes i had a i have a yeah. buddy up in um in boston that sent me that uh, a youtube link i don't know maybe six seven eight years ago of okay. the live record and i was like, oh see i didn't even know about that wait did i get his name right by the way this is bobby brown the guy who lives on a boat yes you got santa right. cruz and okay I was cool like, bobby brown i was like because my last name's brown i was like that's such a okay. common name and i didn't know right. where you were going and as soon as you said okay. that, like he's talking yeah. about talking the boat about, guy yeah the boat guy yeah <laughs> But dude, yes, yeah. he is incredible. And yeah. I've actually spent quite a bit of time over the last maybe two or three years trying to locate him. And I feel like I've had a couple of connections, but it's fallen short. I think he's still alive. I don't know if you've seen oh, him. Okay. Years, but no, I don't know about him. Yeah, I don't know him at all. Kind of I mean, a, he's kind of been a white whale. <laughs> I would love yeah. to talk to that cat. I mean, he's yeah. a trip, man. He's like, a psychedelic Jimmy Buffett meets right. Solo. I don't know. He's he's out there, man. <laughs> he's probably probably better than Jimmy Buffett in many people's estimation. <laughs> well, around when did you start writing and playing music? I mean, obviously, you've been this this biscotti, just always submerging yourself in. <laughs> And, and music and just and, and really <laughs> absorbing that but when did you start to kind of split that atom because it's always i know it's that question everybody's like oh god yeah i remember this but it's super fascinating because there's this split moment where you're like not necessarily i want to be this person on stage i mean it is obviously that dramatic and 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 grand or whatever but there is this kind of splitting atom moment or what mm. happens you're like I really want to start playing music. I want to uh, yeah. do this myself. I want to make records. I want to sing songs. When, when was that time for you? Uh, I, I don't know if I ever had that time where I, there was no time before that. I think like, I, I think the first time I saw music being done by someone else 
I just immediately wanted to to do that with them and become, you know, like I always thought of myself as a musician. Um, uh, I was encouraged, you know, from a really, really young age. My parents were, were I was really lucky to be um, in a situation where, like, my parents gave me, you know, they, they my, my parents got me a drum set when I was, like, three years old. And I had already had, I think, a couple toy ones before that. Um, and, you know, like, I remember, I'm trying to remember, like, you know, what the first music I saw was, it was probably like on TV or something. Mm. Um, and I just, I think I just immediately was like, assumed I could do it, you know, the way that kids, like, just don't have, you know, the, the way that kids don't have fear until they're made to be afraid of something. I mean, right. right. I was never like, I was never like, oh, I'm not a musician. How can I become a musician? It was more like, it was more like I just was lucky that no one ever told me I couldn't be. Um, and I was given some of those tools and I grew up in a world where there were musicians around me. So hey, yeah, your parents um, were artistic and obviously worked in those, in those areas. Yeah. My, my dad worked in the music business. Um, and I, I was able to see concerts from a young age and see recording studios. And I had friends whose parents were musicians. Um, so it just was something that was like, oh, that's like something people do, you know? And and I think I just, when I hear, I, I mean, I'm still like this with music and I assume that other people are too. Like, you just like, I hear that, I hear a sound I like and I just want to become that sound. Like I want to make that sound too, or I want to join in, you know? It's just like, it feels so um, communal or so, uh, it's just so inviting. Like I, I, um, I don't feel separate from music when I hear it. Like music that I love just goes right in to my, into my, my mind. And just, I'm just like immediately, like I'm, I feel like a part of, if it's music I really love, like I feel like I'm part of that music already. So, so it's just like finding a way to, it was just kind of getting access to the, to some instruments and with recording, it was just like, you know, how do I get a tape recorder? Okay, I got one. And I'm going to just, you know, do how, how figuring out how to like, of course, I'm going to make a record. Like, I think when I was pretty young, I was already like, figuring out how to do overdubbing even before I had a four track. Uh-huh. I would play tapes. I would play tapes over this boom box, and then record it on another one and, and play along with them. And it was like, it was just like, okay, how do I make an album? You know, like, how, how do I put these songs together? I mean, I just was very precocious that way and fortunately no one ever stopped me or made me feel silly about that so it was great well i mean you know obviously being around parents that were very much involved in the artistic creative musical world and that kind of being a normal thing for you i mean you you know getting to enjoy concerts getting to enjoy those those benefits from from being in that world at such a young age do you feel like it kind of helped to make your your journey into music maybe a little less scarier or a little less intimidating because it's always that thing Mm -hmm. where you know some of our favorite musicians whether they're you know these insanely famous people or it's just mutual friends and and colleagues um where it's like, seriously, you were afraid to play guitar. I mean, you're you're my favorite. You know what I mean? Like, it's like how mm. how does that even happen? It's like, well, it's it's just the it's the transition of bringing it, bringing summoning that out of you and presenting it was coming from a family that you know always had that around, and that being a very normal thing for you was it a smooth transition to become an artist, to become a musician yourself? Or was it, was it scary? Was it intimidating? Well, yeah. What was, what was that like for you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I just like, I don't feel like I ever became one. I just, or, you know what I mean? Like I don't have a sense of when that started. Um, but I, but I think, um, I mean, if I'm understanding your question, maybe, I mean, does it, maybe it has something to do with um, how the rest of the world sees you or mm. like, or like a professional type of situation of like, how do I become, 
how does this become my job? Is right. I, I don't know if that's what you're asking. Cause, that's because that's I, I mean, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Cause so um, what I would say is that, that um, so I already thought of myself as a musician, but at the same time, I didn't see that as a job or, or as a profession. I saw that as like a calling or, or just sort of like, that's my social identity. Mm. Um, but in terms of like making a living from it, I mean, that right there is a whole other story because right, right. Um, the transition into that becoming a job has never felt comfortable for me. Although, I mean, well, I mean, now I'm, I'm kind of just like, uh, I sort of accept that that's, that that's what I'm doing. Um, you know, at the moment I'm like, I'm, I'm making my living working on other people's music and then my music is sort of, it's something I do mostly, you know, for interest or, you know, as a, for my own enjoyment, but, um, but like, uh, I never made that choice to become a professional musician. It just sort of, it sort of happened gradually. Um, and it's not something that I accept as like a permanent situation either. Like it's sort of like, I'm just, you know, the job part of it or the money part of it or whatever is just like, I'm that, that comes and goes, but the practice of making music, you know, that's a lifelong, um, that's, that has been a lifelong pursuit. Um, that's just sort of like my way of existing in the world. Like it's how I, it's how I make friends. It's how I, um, it's how I participate in the world because I just don't have anything else I do or that, that I'm good at. And um, um, yeah, so so yeah, it, it just wasn't a process of becoming that, it, of becoming a professional musician. In that sense, I, I, I feel as though I never have become one um, because I still struggle with like, well, how am I going to, how do I make ends meet? And how, how, how do I, ch how do you charge money for something that you're going to just do anyway? It's sort of like, you're kind of just you're kind of I'm, I'm like the worst business person in the world because i'm just like well here you go this is worth nothing do it you know like give me some money for it like I, I mean i'm not saying that it's worth nothing i mean it's worth it's worth an infinite amount right yeah but but in the, in the marketplace i don't have a sense of i don't have a strong belief in music as a commodity because it's it's so much more than that um and so go, that goes back to all of our questions the questions I think before of right, yeah. music and everything, it's just um, like, I, I don't, I don't have a strong sense of why one, you know, why music, some one music is worth more than another. Like to me, the whole thing is worth an infinite amount, the whole sum of music being made in the world because it's, um, you know, it's, it's priceless. These are people's lives. It's their spirit. And um, this is human culture that uh that we need you know like so what how, how do you if you're just taking that to the marketplace to sell that it's it's pretty strange it's um strange. but but that, that is what we do you know that, yeah. that is what we do so i never became and, and yeah if I, if I thought about it that way like okay i'm going to become a professional musician i mean yeah i would be terrified i'd be terrified that i was selling my soul right um and I would be terrified because becoming a music is becoming a professional musician is like you have a one in ten zillion chance of making a decent living at it. Like most people, that almost everyone doing it does not make a living doing it. And if you're doing, if you're getting into it for that reason, you're probably going to be disappointed. But if you're getting it into it for the reason of just um, to um, appease your spirit, then you'll always win, but you know, it may or may not be a job. So yeah, there, there's always this sense of, I would be doing this anyway. Like, right. I would be doing this anyway, if this was going well, or if this wasn't going well. So there's like this, you know, my fiance, she, she's a, she owns her own business and does graphic design and photography. And there's just this constant, um, back and forth night and day of what am I doing? Oh, I'm, this is, I'm having fun. This is great. The next mm -hmm. day, why did I even sign up for this? And it's always, right. like you're putting out these, 
um, existential fires, but you're also lighting them. It's, it's, it is super, super fascinating, but I kind of always tell her, tell her or remind her, I should say, and remind myself, like, you know, you would be doing this anyway. You know, when you were a kid, you were kind of doing this anyway, like in school, you know, you were, you were always drawing or even you, you were always playing music or listening. And then, you know, kind of going full circle, it's as you get older, you just kind of enter these different, you know, layers and tiers of maybe what you expect out of yourself or maybe just certain goals. Um, and most of the things that we're trying to accomplish, it's really just trying to get through <laughs> you know the ecosystem or the wilderness of all the baggage to get to what it is that you're trying to accomplish which is really just to kind of make it happen you know like Mm. Yeah. it kind of does go full circle with most things are a miracle that they even exist you know everything else kind of comes um a, a fast second but i wanted to ask you real quickly because i want to Mm. obviously lead up to the new album but Briefly, briefly on the curtains and deer hoof because i've been a fan of those bands for so long and i'm can speak for so many other people that i know love those bands i was Oh, thank you. i was familiar with deer hoof um prior to the curtains i i, I got familiar Mm. with those get with you know with that much um later on but just kind of briefly i would love to know those you know the early you know coming into the early to the mid 2000s with those groups um yeah i would just love to know a little bit about the history of those bands man and just kind of more kind of a retrospect of you know fond memories of obviously you know sometimes every album you do is almost like this different part of you i don't know if it's that dramatic or you know symbolic to you but Yeah, I would love to know a little bit about just kind of the the the, the dawn of those two bands. Okay. Um, well, um, the, I mean, Deer Hoof, I, I don't actually know when it started. I think it was like mid nineties. It started, I, I was not an original member at all. Right, right. Um, so I couldn't really speak to the, the origins of that. I mean, I've, um, I've been told a little bit about it, but, um, I think it started, it was Greg and Rob, I think first Rob Fisk and Greg Sanye, and then, And then Satomi joined. Um, basically, I mean, just to fast forward to the part that I did experience firsthand, um, they were a trio with John, Greg, and Satomi. And I was just a huge, I was a huge fan. Um, kind of like around starting like kind of 2000 when I first heard them. Um, I just, I thought, I, I was not, to be honest, I was not, super like i had heard some of the real early stuff in the 90s and i didn't like totally connect with it right away and then when i heard them around 2000 it was i think they were like working on um like uh the reveille stuff that the stuff that's on that record and i just um i just thought they sounded so it sounded like such a classic rock band it just was like it kind of re kindled my interest in rock music because at the time I was really kind of not a big rock music listener anymore. Um, so uh, the history of me joining it was, was um, let's see, John, John went away for a couple months. Greg and Satomi, I had just befriended them. We, the curtains, I was doing the curtains before I joined your house. Right, And, right. um, and I had befriended them. giving them cassette tapes of my music and asking them if I could play, sh if we, I could open for them. We did a couple of shows together, became friends. I you know, just started hanging out with them a bit. And John and I, we, we had like a free improv session once or twice, the four of us. Um, and then John and I started writing some music together, which became Natural Dreamers. And um, then John went out of town for like a couple of months and I knew Greg and Satomi wouldn't have that much to do. So I talked them into joining the curtains. Um, and um, which at the time was, was me and Trevor Shimizu and Jamie Peterson. And um, 
And we had recorded a record before that, the three of us. And then Greg and Satomi joined. Um, John came back. They asked me to join Deerhoof on, I think, playing keyboard for at first. I played keyboard for a couple shows. Um, and yeah, it was just, I don't, I'm not sure, sure I could, what to say. I mean, it was, I was, I was such a huge fan. It was like a dream come true. I just kind of like what I was saying about just wanting to become a part of whatever music that I, I connect with. Right. I, they were such, I just connected with them. So, so hard. I was, it was just like, of course I'm in it. I just kind of like walked my way into that band somehow. I don't know. I think I felt, I mean, I might've just been in the right place at the right time. I'm sure they were just, they probably just needed someone else to like fill in some of the parts that were, you know, from the recordings. Um, but I just felt so lucky to be there and immediately just, you know, just immersed myself in their music and their way of doing things. And that really had a big influence on me and made me want to start writing, you know, pop, more, more vocal music, like poppier yeah, song yeah. type of music. So the curtain started off kind of as um, instrumentals and then it kind of gradually became more and more song vocal based. Um, and I don't know. Is that, does that give you enough? No, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure what else to say. There's, there's so much I could talk about, but I don't, I don't know which, what's no, the most I, interesting. I, yeah, I appreciate that because I just, yeah, I just wanted to know, you know, obviously, joining that band and being a fan, which is just such an awesome and unique um, situation. I was recently talking to um, Kelly Stoltz, and mm. he was telling me that. You know, growing, you know, kind of becoming age in the '80s and being a huge Echo and the Bunnymen fan, which who isn't? It's one of they're one of my favorite bands. And then mm. fast forward thirty odd years later, and you're playing in this band, and it's just like you can't make this stuff up. There's always these weird, almost borderline paranormal experiences in mm. just musicians' careers, whether it's just things lining up the star whatever it may be you know astral yeah. but i i know as you you know just very well said that's something that i'm sure that you reflect back on from time to time and you're like man like that really all that just lined up <laughs> and that just happened. yeah i mean i mean for me i think it's been mostly just a matter of like putting myself in in the you know like putting myself in these places right. um and just waiting because it's like I'm really shy and I'm not, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, like when you, when you were saying, you know, like, what's it like to become, well, what was my process like becoming a musician and did I want to like get up on stage and stuff? And it's like, no, actually I never, it was never like, Oh, just let me up on stage. I just want to be, it wasn't like that. It was like, it was more just like, I love what's happening here. And I'm just going to like go over, go over into this and just like immerse myself in it somehow and see what happens. And if I had stopped and thought about it and been like, like, um, how do I get myself up on stage in front of that microphone? I never would have done that. Yeah. And it wouldn't have even been something I desired. But I I did want to be in this music somehow. Like, I I wanted to, like, um, just, like, be part of it in some way. And I didn't know what that way was. And it was really just kind of, like, um, letting it happen. Like, just kind of, like, being in the right place and just letting it happen and just trying to trying to... Um, not, I didn't, you know, like I'm kind of shy and I didn't want to push myself outside of my comfort zone, but I just kind of track, kind of tricked myself into, into, um, you know, being like being in these places and just sort of like role playing, like, yeah, I'm a musician, you know, even though I'm just like, yeah. I'm, I mean, I know all, all I know is like, I'd like to play guitar at home, you know, and I, I do stuff on my four track privately but suddenly it was it was just like like um oh yeah sure like i'm a musician somebody asked like the curtains i never tried to get the curtain shows at first we were doing stuff we were writing um these instrumentals and just getting together and playing and then i remember this guy that used to come into amoeba when i worked this is when i worked at amoeba this guy damon smith who was a free jazz bass player in the bay area and i'm not sure where he's now but he was booking shows at this place called the luggage store is that what it's called? The luggage store. I think it's a gallery, art gallery in, in um, downtown San Francisco. 
like free improv kind of stuff. And he was like, yeah. he was like, Hey, just cause he knew I was into free jazz or, you know, we had some, we had some shared interest or something. He was like, Hey, uh, he was booking shows there and he was just like, Hey, come play this. You, you want to play this show? And it was like, Oh, I guess I could. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. It was, so it was just like by being at the record store, by just talking to people about music, things that I was excited about, it just kind of, it just happened. It was, yeah, it was not, um, it was not a lot of hard effort. It was more just like putting myself in the way of these people. And, and then now later on, it became more like, okay, this is work. And I'm actually like, this is, you know, it isn't just like a funny, happy accident. It's more like, okay, this is what I do. And, um, you know, being more, having more forethought about it, but, Back then, it was just kind of falling into things. Was was that more of the situation going into Overgrown Path, which, by the way, is a masterpiece, in my opinion? <laughs> oh, thank you. Love, love that record. Thank you. Was that more in that headspace that may be speaking the obvious or asking the obvious, um, here, but just having... Oh, uh, no, I mean... Opinion, having that very strong, like... All right, yeah, I have I have this to say, I have this to kind of express. No, I mean, um when I started doing that, um I had just uh gotten out of a like I was in a relationship with um Nadal Teresi, who's my bandmate in Cryptosize. We 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 started Cryptosize together. Uh that was the band that I did kind of simultaneously as the curtains after Deerhoof. Um and we were like we were going really hard on that band and then kind of things kind of ended. And so I was like, okay, I, you know, it was just like a very new phase of life where I'm like newly single, newly without a band and without any kind of, I had no um, like way to go about making music with other people or doing shows or anything. It was just, that was really just a process of um, getting back to, it was just, you know, like kind of like a gift to myself of like, right, right. Um, of like, I'm just going to do this. It's, it's really, it's like a, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's like, uh, um, it was something that I did to kind of like get through that time to sort of like, just a way to spend my time really. Right. And, oh, and it was also a way to explore, um, like musical territory that I hadn't been able to explore in Cryptosize or with any of the other bands. And I wanted to kind of, I just remember at the time being like, I want to get back to um, stuff that, first of all, I wanted to do something that was like um, not trying to compete with anything else that's around. Like I was like, I want to just reconnect with my sort of like high school era self and my taste of that time of like listening to soft machine and, um, <laughs> and like uh, the sort of like proggy, but song based soulful type of, I, I don't know what it was. It was just like, I wanted to do music without, um, that wasn't strongly guitar based, but was more like keyboard based. So I started writing everything on piano and I had just gotten a piano. That was the other thing was like kind of a gift to myself. I I had um, moved into this apartment by myself and was like, I'm going to get a piano. I really want to just, I just knew I wanted to play piano and just write songs on piano. Um, but yeah, so so it wasn't like, I'm like, I have this to say. It was more just like, I want to explore this and I don't know what I have to say. Um, and this is what I'm going to spend my time doing. I was working in a restaurant um like uh as a prep cook and waiter at this like breakfast place that was sort of like I remember I worked in the mornings and I was done by like one in the afternoon. So it was sort of like this is what I would do, you know, this was how I would spend my day. Um just yeah, like for my own enjoyment and to kind of like reconnect with this part of myself that I felt like I maybe I had lost or something or just hadn't had a chance to really get back to in a while so yeah it, it does it does feel kind of like this 
very personal homecoming, like getting back to things that, you know, like you said, that are, you know, familiar and things that you kind of, you know, just getting, getting back to the center of it all. Um, yeah, you know, actually, I mean, maybe, maybe one thing I could say about that, um, there, I think that at this time, at the time I was doing that record, um, I sort of was like allowing myself, or I guess it was the first time that I was not embarrassed about some of my like kind of hippier roots, mm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. musically, like, like, um, this is something that people might not realize about like the, the early 2000s and the 90s and stuff. I mean, nowadays I feel like everybody, you could be into anything you want. Everything goes everything together now. <laughs> but but back then it was so, things were so, um, things were so cliquish and, and separated, you know, and it was like, I felt like I never quite fit into the mold um, of, like, I always wanted to be part of, uh, you know, underground music, right? But um, underground music at that time, or at least in my little world, it did not include, you know, music it was inspired by the Grateful Dead or even Soft Machine. I mean, you know, Soft Machine was not cool, especially. I, I just remember in the in the milieu of like San Francisco kind of noise rock and stuff. It was like, I just, you know, it was like, I felt kind of embarrassed about being a deadhead. I mean, even going back to like in college when I first went to Santa Cruz in the early 90s, I had been a kind of a big dead. I was really into the dead when I was in high school. And when I went off to college, I remember I was like, I had already kind of been like, okay, this is, it's kind of like, if I'm going to fit in with the people that I want, I'm I'm, this is, I'm saying this with such regret and such shame about this, but I'm just being honest. Um, when I, when I was like, okay, I want to, the, the kids that I want to be, I want to be part of this cool clique of like, uh, you know, the art students that were like kind of, kind of DIY and punk and like, you know, into other weird music, but at the time was not, it was not cool to be, if you, if you know, to play guitar, to be like inspired by Jerry Garcia is like, there's no, there was no space for that. <laughs> and, and I, I still had long hair kind of. And I remember just like, it was like really hard to make friends, honestly. I mean, maybe it was just me. <laughs> it was probably just me. I was really shy too. But when I went to UC Santa Cruz, I remember all these like, you know, kind of like post emo kind of um, DIY punk. Like I was into punk and that's the thing that I could not quite understand was like, I was into punk too. I was into like, you know, Southern California punk from the eighties. And, you know, I liked minor threat too. And I liked, um, you know, I liked black flag and I liked PIL and I was into like, you know, weird stuff, but I was also into the dead. And there's like, <laughs> for some reason for some reason it just was like that was i didn't have any friends that i could share that with and i was very closeted about my my dead deadheadness so i just remember with overground path being like fuck it i'm gonna like there was some song like i remember like playing a little guitar part part and being they came just came out of my just came out of nowhere just from my brain but i remember thinking like oh that sounds kind of jerry-ish and being like fuck it i'm not gonna I'm not going to throw that away. That, that's a good part. And just leaving that in there. And um, I have to say, I have to credit uh, Cass McCombs was someone that I was hanging out with at the time because I was playing with him. I was also playing with White Magic a bit at that time too, like 2009 or 10. Yeah. And Mira's, you know, Mira is kind of more of my aesthetic. You know, I think we probably share more of that hippie aesthetic or something. I just remember Cass, Cass McCombs was like my first like adult deadhead friend who's just like yeah. i'm into the dead and i'm into all this other shit and like like i'm not going to be ashamed of that and i just thought yeah. i just thought oh my god i'm such a fool you know like all these years i've just been denying myself this enjoyment so i kind of got, got you know rediscovered those those roots of mine with that record well dude it, it also and you know maybe you also had this kind of old soul too because you know being around your parents and the profession that they were in and just being you know obviously you're still you know you're around the same stuff that you know 
classmates and friend of friends and just anybody that's in, in and around the same age group, but there's, you know, they're listening to like, you know, and not making assumptions, but may, let's just, you know, safely, sa safely say we can, that they're listening to right then and now, like what was happening now. And you were kind of, you know, like, Hey, I, I like this other shit that, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I like to, I like contemporary music. Yeah, yeah, no, I, no, I get what you're saying. I mean, um, it's true that I'm kind of a nostalgia monger, um, in some ways, but I mean, I'm also, I also do, do enjoy contemporary music, and I always have. Um, but it's just like it was. Sometimes it was, it was hard to find contemporary music that I connected with, right. and then also, I think I just had such a sense of, um like there was so much music from history and not just music i mean i think like i remember um you know growing up like my the tv that i watched was like uh like saturday morning i would wake up at 6 a.m and i would watch um davy and goliath which is like this um uh stop motion animation um christian um uh kids show from like the 60s i would watch like gumby yeah uh, Davy and Goliath, and then I would watch like The Little Rascals, Three Stooges, um, The Monsters, uh, Twilight Zone. Like basically, I watched a lot of just because that was what was there. I mean, it's kind of right. like kids now. It's kind of like with the internet now. You know, like everything is there for you to access at all times. And and growing up um, in the eighties, I mean, there like when you turn on the TV, um, there's still a lot of old stuff out there that they were just you know peddling, still peddling these old reruns of stuff. And it was like, Nash I loved all that stuff too. And it just had, what's that? Sorry to interrupt you. I was like, I'll just say Mash is still like, that is TV still, you know, like you've got, oh, Mash? yeah. Like those things still run, but yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. It's, it's those, those generations colliding. Yeah. It's all kind of there. If you, if you, um, if you want it and it's like, yeah, I guess sort of the, the, the texture, just sort of the aesthetic and texture of these things, you know, it can be really interesting, but, um, you know, I, I mean, I liked contemporary music too. Um, but I was the contemporary music. Okay. Like, let me say this. Um, okay. So my last, the, the self-titled solo record, um, great one, record. one thing, thanks. <laughs> one thing I, I was thinking about while I was making this record and I still think about is that, um, there was a period like, okay, like up until I hit, uh like maybe age 13 or 14 or something like i was really still into all the contemporary i mean i liked some older stuff that was around you know that my parents had old records and stuff but i was the main music i was into was what was on the radio i mean i was not my taste was not like um i was not a snob as a kid obviously you know um but i was trying to think about like when did i become a snob you know like when did i when did I start being like, oh, I'm into you know this or that, and I, I was trying to like kind of kind of like touch the with, with my music and that third solo record. I was trying to kind of like touch that aesthetic a little bit of like what what was happening right at the right at, right before I started to to become more like identifying myself through my taste. Um, and so I so I wanted to kind of embody that aesthetic a little bit of like the early '80s, I think. It was, or well, I guess I was, no, I was younger than 13 or 14. I guess I was what, seven or eight or nine or something at that age. But that I just loved everything that was out there back then. Everything that was on the radio, all the top 40 music. I was pretty indiscriminate except for like maybe a few songs. Like, um, you know, I didn't like Don Henley or uh, <laughs> yeah. there, was, there was a couple of songs I wasn't into that were on the radio, but by and large, everything that they played on top 40 radio was like sounded great to me. And then there was just this switch where I suddenly, you know, had this like hipster awareness of like, of like um, being different or whatever. Right, right. Um, and um, so I, I wanted to like revisit that, the aesthetic of that time, because it still is very potent, emotionally potent to me. Yeah. Um, that, that the period of the early 80s, like maybe like up to 84 or something. And um yeah, so I I liked the old stuff too, but I was I don't know what I don't know what happened when why that was when I started trying to identify myself through like being different 
like having different tastes. Um, I could go into that more, but no, that's yeah. no, man, that's all. And also, you know, thank you so much for, for really like laying that out because that is interesting to think about because, you know, as musicians or writers or, you know, journalists or just anybody that's in the creative um, bubble or whatever, there is kind of like maybe a, a universal assumption that you, you know, kind of quote unquote, know your shit, you know? And it's like, mm. is that just kind of like, and it's, and everything has um, um, this competitiveness, you know? And of course a lot, and which is, you know, kind of ironic is a lot of people that are, you know, that, grow to love playing music or, you know, making arts because, you know, maybe they didn't get along with the sports crowd, but it's all, I, I would say the music industry is more competitive than, than sports. You know what I mean? At least there's just an ungodly amount of money and professional sports, but mm. I feel like, um, no, it, it it's it, it is interesting to to ask yourself when did I become a snob? <laughs> like when yeah, I mean, did I only want to, you know, do this, but that some of that reminded me and I and we could do a whole other podcast on this, but I'm a nostalgic freak. Like I love mm. like I just I love everything that was essentially before me and and now starting to appreciate things you know uh, you know as they were but just me and my fiance we watch can't hardly wait probably twice a month it's one of our favorites and that movie is a really good example of all the different kind of clubs you know you've got your the jocks you've got these guys you got this and of course you know you're watching that and you're like man i would totally be in that crew like no doubt about it like you kind of pick your your team but obviously you know this movie you know obviously we're jumping back you know this was kind of around the time that you know you're going to school and you're seeing this kind of in front of you and you know you're you, you're a deadhead and you're trying to you know trying to find out which by the way i would that this would be my favorite movie if that was a movie or a book, I would, that would be it for me. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. It's that, that's an interesting thing to, to kind of ponder on. Um, but also I definitely just think mm -hmm. I confuse myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's cool. Uh, I actually but, don't know that. I don't know that movie. What is Can't Hardly Wait? Oh man. Watch that movie, please. Can't Hardly okay. Wait. It's, kind of loosely based off the um replacement song which replacements are an incredible band but it's it's just the last day of high school it's almost kind of like this days confused kind of vibe but okay i think yeah, i know that one yeah it's it's just the last day of high school and all these kids are like uh, all right let's have one more party because tomorrow we're all gonna move away or whatever and it's just kind of mm -hmm. like whatever you wanted to happen at the end of the year. It's just this nostalgic, youthful, but there is also that identity existentialism of like, where the hell do I fit in? Like, yeah, I well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think everybody, uh, I mean, most people feel that way um, that they don't, or I don't know, I, would, I, I, don't, I don't mean to speak, I don't know, actually, but I imagine, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I imagine most people, most people feel that way. Um, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that I that I like wanted to be part of some crowd. I mean, I think um, I think uh, oh, I don't know. I was young. Well, and I'll, you know, adding to that, you know, growing up here, and maybe it's similar for you, you know, growing up in California in those areas, but you know, kind of growing up here in the in the sticks and country of Tennessee, it was you know, there was a money factor in a lot of things, mm. which is all, you know, obviously super funny to think about because when you're in third grade, it's not like your third grade classmates have the the money or whatever, but there was, you know, obviously this really, you know, there's this, there's this big sense of, 
oh, well, this person's, you know, bringing their own lunch and they have this and they have that. And you're kind of like, oh, well, this is where I am, you know? So there is this kind of, well, I want to be on this, this, this indoctrinated kind of, this is how things maybe should be, but I don't know, man. I, I'll... You're talking, yeah, you're, are, are you saying, um, you're talking about like sort of where does class consciousness begin? I guess, yeah. And, in, in, yeah, in a way. I mean, but yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I mean, it start. I, I, as far as I can remember, I feel like it, in my world, it was like there pretty quickly. You know, it's, kids, kids get indoctrinated very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it's kind of there waiting, but, um, yeah, obviously, you know, recording that essentially that trilogy on captured tracks, which are, are beautiful works. I would love to, and obviously, you know, becoming a producer, I mean, like you said earlier, you know, working with other bands, um, segueing into your new record man paint a room which it's such a beautiful album man oh, I, thank you i i really really enjoyed it and i almost se selfishly have to ask when are you going to be on this side of the country to play this record because i would love to hear this album live man it's oh uh, yeah thank you all the folks um, that shows that we're that you're that you're doing every time we like put these in the newsletter or do this or do that i'm like man i'm so jealous i would love uh, <laughs> to be in those you know in those settings to see this record but man yes i'm obviously i'm rambling but yeah tell me okay. about this record man like well um as far as uh playing shows i mean i'm actually um i'm coming out i mean if i'm not I'm not going to Nashville as far as I know, but um, I mean, just yet. Um, but the, I'm doing this run of shows in October that's going to start in somewhere in like Richmond, Virginia is the first show right now, but I might even try to add something before that. Um, and I mean, Nashville is like almost close enough, but I feel like maybe not quite but close enough. I forget how long of a drive it is from Nashville to, to Richmond. Virginia um but my booker is like trying to find me something around the, you know around there that's about a nine um, yeah so that's that's probably too far I'm gonna I'm gonna do another tour in 2025 like springtime or mm -hmm. beginning of the year sometime um and uh hopefully just hit all the spots that I missed um this year so um I'll try, yeah, definitely try to get out there. I mean, it's uh, it's part of the difficulty of booking shows in, in 2024 that's just like putting together a driving tour. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, it just didn't like come together in the way that I'm used to and it ended up just being this flying out thing to the East Coast. Um, I wish I was just driving through the whole country and doing it the way I would always do it, but... Um, Anyway, so that's in answer to your question about playing shows. Um, yeah, that, that always goes full circle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm used to just do it like getting in a van and doing like a whole driving tour of the whole country, um, and and I think it's just like the costs have gotten so high that it's sort of people I think maybe are trying to do more like focused, shorter tours. But um, I don't know. I'm yeah. still trying to figure it out. Yeah, man, just staying out on the road for like three, four weeks and just nonstop and then going back home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's usually what I do. Um, yeah, it's usually what I do. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I've got, um, I mean, the, there's, uh, there's a whole new version of my band. Um, I just moved to the Bay Area last summer um, as I was finishing the record. So um, I put together a new version of the group here. Um, like uh, the folks that I made the record with in LA, some of them, um, you know, aren't available when I'm just having kids and stuff. So, and I wanted to try to like uh, have something that I actually do here that I'm part of 
um, in the Bay Area. So it seemed like I should just try to make my band be, you know, totally based here. So um, I'm really, really happy uh, with the new group and people I found are really great. And um, we're just, you know, putting the finishing touches on the set right now. And we're going to start doing shows in a few weeks. And um, yeah, I don't know. Making the record was a whole separate process. Um, that was mostly done in LA. Um, and I mean, we, yeah, I could tell you about that if you want. Absolutely. Dude, absolutely. Anything yeah. That you're, yeah, anything you're comfortable to indulge in, man. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, be a painter room was started as like demos that, that, uh, that I did with the intention of, um, playing show, like, you know, teaching them to the, the live group and playing shows together and then recording after doing a bunch of shows, which was something I haven't done in quite a while. You know, I, like that was what I used to do in old bands, but right. for my solo thing, it was always like, I'm going to make the record by myself and teach everybody the parts afterwards. So that was the plan. And, um, you know, that was more or less what happened. A few of the songs are just me and, um, you know, like, it, it came together as like no, it's not like a totally live record um but um yeah a lot of it was done with with the live group and um and i recorded it in the in my home studio in my garage in, in la and um i uh i asked josh johnson to write some horn charts and jeff parker wrote a horn chart and um and that those the, the arrangements were kind of done separately from the basic tracks. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's the record is my first one for Hardly Art. And, you know, I'm very thankful to them. They helped me uh, put all this stuff together. And it was, I guess, it, what I would say about this record is it's kind of like um, me acting as my as a producer sort of yeah. producing my record the way that i produce other people's records um instead of just like producing and playing every single thing myself um it was more like you know taking a step back from it um and um kind of putting it putting it together with other people and um it was really a great experience and it was just you know something i wanted to try that i had never done for myself so i'm really glad i was able to to do that i'm very pleased with how it turned out and yeah i don't know what else to say about it oh man that's it's 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 beautiful man and i and i always kind of not necessarily hate the word but just kind of don't use it so freely or whatever because i feel like sometimes it can it can kind of seem like it has maybe like a negative you know kind of vibe to it or whatever but polished you know when you hear when you say I'm mm -hmm. all it's really polished, it's like, like it almost kind of takes the the shit out of it or something. But there, um, it, not for me. I mean, I like all kinds of music. I like unpolished, I, yeah. polished, everything in between. I mean, it's just a, it's just one aesthetic choice among among many. You know, um, yeah. Well, like, just, uh, yeah, it just it, it's. I'm just been doing. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm. I mean, I'm happy if, if it sounds polished to you. Like that's that's yeah. nice. I like that. Yeah, well, and you know, obviously, you know, it's I just never want to, um, yeah, I never just want to make somebody feel uncomfortable when obviously, oh, no. you know what I mean? Because it's there's constant like, um, just the opinions of things these days are just a little <laughs> loud, but polished in the sense of, like you said, coming at it from, you know, obviously writing it creating it this is your music this is this is your body of work but coming at it from that perspective too of being you know the producer um you feel that in this album like the album is i don't know there's there's a density to this album that mm. i yeah there, there there's not that there isn't with any of your past works with the with the captured tracks records but there's there's like this sense of warmth and obviously as i'm staring at mm. the beautiful cover 
honestly, and I know this may sound like a kind of like a scapegoat thing to say, but the cover really feels like the body of music that's on the album. Man, I feel like Oh, yeah. the the choice of medium to bring out the cover um in this in this room with the fireplace and the stairs going up um upstairs it it feels like that man it feels like a very comfortable place and obviously you know coming off of the years that we've been talking about over this you know this course of this hour or so um it feels like a, a very welcoming and a very um It just feels like a home run, man. It's I can use all the adjectives and you know, just <laughs> Thank bat, you know batter us both dizzy, but it feels like a welcome home record in a way. you. That's yeah. I mean, that, that's great. I mean, thank you. I mean, I think that that's just the power of of records, like uh, you know, of, of the sound and image. You just you make you know you make the music. You get a picture. You know, the person that that finds the record, they they get the picture with the music, and it's just you know. I mean, I suppose you could put a cover on it that just wouldn't resonate at all. But um, I feel like when you just get somewhere close, it just, you know, the two things, um, you know, just like form this third thing together um, that neither of them has separately. You know, like um, that that picture was, it's just a total accident. Um, my friend Jess made that picture when she was like in her teens, like in the 80s. Um, she, she was, she, it was part of her portfolio to get into this, um, arts high school that she had applied to. And then, um, recently she was going through her parents' house and cleaning out her old stuff. And she found that and she just gave it to me and my partner, Kate, and we put it up on our, um, on our, um, mantelpiece in our living room. And it sat there next to the piano, um, while I wrote a lot of the songs. So it was, it was there and part of the process, I think. And maybe that's why it, like, maybe that's why it works. with the music but um but it was also just kind of accidental too you know like um and i wasn't sure that that was going to be the cover um for a while you know i was i was like thinking about different covers and trying different things and but in a way um i feel like it just kind of was always there as a cover and um like the song painter room um wasn't written with that image in mind or anything but then you know obviously it just uh it it all you know, fits together pretty well. Um, and uh, I guess it's just an accident, but but um, maybe maybe the, the drawing influence the record, I don't know. Well, it's if that's the case, it's the perfect accident. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just funny how it wasn't obvious to me that that would be the cover right away. Right, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah. The more I look at it, and the more I yeah, the more I've like looked at that cover, I I love it more and more. Um, I'm just yeah, it sat really well with me over time. So that's always a good sign, you know. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Well, Chris, I don't want to keep you much longer. It's, you know, getting late for both of us. And I want to let you get to your night so you can enjoy your Okay. night. Yeah. Thank you. And I really appreciate you not only wanting to do this, but also just kind of helping navigate this. Um, I appreciate your patience and understanding and, um, It's it's been a pleasure, man, speaking with you. I yeah, it's there there are a couple um moments while doing the podcast where I'm like, you know, whether you've been listening to the guests for for years or somebody that you've kind of recently discovered, um, you know, there's always connections via, you know. certain ways you go about life or obviously your favorite records, but I do feel that, I don't know. I feel like there was definitely a connection where I was like, man, I feel like I know this guy. <laughs> like, I feel like, you know, we like a lot of the, the same things. And usually I even hate the word interview, but I feel like that word 
and the weight of what that word has kind of always been vanished. And I just have really enjoyed this conversation, man. And I, I, I really, Oh, thank you. yeah, I really appreciate you taking this time, man. I, Yeah, my my pleasure. Thanks for asking me, Dakota, and thank you for um, you know, spending time with my music. And um, yeah, I mean that's that's the beauty of music. It's just uh, you know, we put ourselves out there, and then uh, yeah, you can get to know somebody through their music. I mean, of course, I don't know, I don't know you. I mean, I don't know the people listening to my music, but I think if you listen to my music, you probably know something about me. Um, and I love that about music just in general. It's just, um, you know, you, you get to, you learn something about, about, uh, other people and about yourself. So, um, thanks, thanks for spending time with my music and thanks for talking. I really appreciate it.